presentation for us. So I can I invite uh, Professor Lynette Chia to share her screen and to also present. Thank you, Lynette. Yes. Thank you so much, Aslam, for the introduction and, uh, and for hosting. So I really appreciate Sustainability SG Collective's uh, work in this area. I'm so glad to see so many uh, participants gathered, gathered today. So I thought it would be helpful to start off today's webinar with some, um, just uh, like you said, Aslam, it helps have this general context. So I wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, I hope everyone can see my, my screen. Uh, I'd like to talk about, you know, the importance of uh, considering resource efficiency, uh, why, why it's important, what is the circular economy that we're talking about today, which is the main topic, and, and how to go about doing it. So I, I, have, to be, I have to be quite brief because I want to preserve time for the other speakers as well. So let's see whether you can see. Yes, okay. So in terms of global resource use, and when we talk about resources, we're talking about things like uh, um, both materials as well as energy. And this use has been growing quite uh, dramatically over the past century. So this chart here shows material use uh, over the past 100 years, growing from about 7 billion tons used per year to around 60 up to year 2005. The more recent numbers have shown it growing closer to 100, so almost two orders of magnitude over the past 100 years. Part of it's driven by our primary energy use, so reliance on fossil fuels, fuels which is driving a lot of the climate change that Aslam has, has introduced. Um, when we think about uh, extraction of resources, which I just shown, it also, we're also concerned about the, the outflows or the emissions and waste that is generated as a result of all this use of the resources. So we're using resources and we're extracting it for feeding the, the human population, feeding the livestock that supports the human population, uh, and also building all this uh, manufactured capital. So these are things like our buildings, our roads, our uh, uh, airplanes, and, and the things that we use. So uh, we have the inflows, we have the stock that accumulates, and we have the outflows that generate it. And we're concerned about the outflows, of course, because um, along with the inflows, we have deposited quite a lot of waste and emissions to the environment since uh, 1900. And um, it's a challenge that is, is a concern, and it's actually a, a growing one as well. So while we are concerned with... Um, oh, Yeah, I forgot that to balance the slide. So I was talking about this one where we are concerned about the, the inflows, the outflows, and as well as, as well as the stocks. So while we're concerned with waste management, there's also other two other issues I wanted to highlight. One is the issue of resource scarcity. So while we can, you know, while we're concerned with uh, emitting all these emissions and waste, we're also concerned with how much of available resources can we economically uh, uh, obtain or extract. Uh, from the environment before we start to start to run out. There's also this issue of um, global inequities or um, consumers of the future. So um, a lot of this uh, resource consumption is correlated with uh, with GDP. So an economy that's doing well demands more energy and resources. So um, with growing affluence in, in developing economies, particularly in Asia, uh, so we're on a path where we are demanding more resources uh, uh, in the future. And, and this, this cannot be denied because the economies need to grow. So how can we find more creative ways to achieve the same quality of life with less resources. So we have here a picture of um, the linear economy, which is similar to what I've described earlier. Where what I've shown was previously a, a linear pattern of resource consumption. You extract resources, use them, and somehow dispose them. But we can interpret it for uh, uh, individual product level as well, or systems level. So any product can be broken down into different life cycle stages that are shown over here. So in order to make any product, you have to extract the materials that needed to go into it. You have to manufacture the components, we have to distribute it to the end user. The end user makes use of it and eventually dispose of it. So this life cycle perspective helps us to consider the impacts of products that we use a bit more, uh, more, more comprehensively and, and more carefully. Um, so it's, it's typically, you know, at, when it reaches the end of life, it's disposed in the incineration or the landfill. And we've seen that with this linear uh, interpretation, it's, it's problematic because this make use dispose, dispose pattern uh, depletes resources and actually requires uh, proper waste, waste management uh, at the end. So this is the alternative. This is the concept of a, a circular economy uh, where it's an alternative to the linear economy. It finds different ways to keep products and materials in continual use. So instead of make, use, dispose and consuming more resources every time we demand uh, a new need, uh, we're trying to find different ways to reuse the product, refurbish it, remanufacture the components and parts, and recycle the materials if possible. So by closing these loops, we're 
der deriving more use, uh, usefulness you know, out of these committed resources for as long as possible, uh, minimizing waste generation. So here's the definition in, in, in black and white. You know, we're trying to reuse the waste in economy to create these closed loops, uh, ideally reuse uh, the resources so there'll be minimal effect to an environment. So the Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation is, is, has been quite good in producing a lot of materials and references on the circular economy. So that's a good one to, to look up. Um, so we are trying to restore and, and regenerate um, the things that we use uh, to keep the components in, their, in the highest use and value at, at all times. So that's the concept of the circular economy. How do we actually go about achieving it? It's actually quite challenging, uh, but there are different ways to think about it and try to break it down. So when we design products and, and the things that we use, we try to reduce the material use if possible. Uh, we try to optimize the material types that we, we use, you know, either using renewable materials or recycled materials. Uh, we can think about exchanging waste and input materials from different entities. Uh, we can try to improve the use phase so we can either extend how long we use the product and keep it in, 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 uh, in use. Um, we can maintain and repair. So all these uh, repair kopitiams that we might have come across to, to prolong the, the use of the product. We can reuse it, redistribute it, resell it, pass it on to someone else, um, refurbish and remanufacture and recycle uh, the materials. So if we look at the last few, you know, we're talking about uh, reusing, redistributing, refurbishing, recycling. I'd like to pose a question. I don't know whether you can think about it uh, and, and consider which one is most preferable, which one is least preferable. So we go back to this chart here that shows these loops, right? So is it better to reuse a product or is it better to recycle a product? So just, just think about that. Now maybe we can entertain uh, that, that, that answer later. Um, but ultimately, the, 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 the concept of the, 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 to sum up, you know, the concept of the circular economy is intended to you know, promote uh, resource efficiency because it's, it's, uh, we're generating a lot of problems associated both the, with the waste as well as the limited uh, available materials that we have, especially with the non-renewable uh, resources that we're consuming. Um, so we've introduced the concept of the circular economy and some indication of how to achieve it. I think in reality, it's actually not so easy. It's, it's still a lot to do and, and uh, before we can uh, achieve this ideal. Uh, but if we can, I think this is a really nice way to think of and, and frame, frame our minds around you know, how, how to achieve the, the circular economy. Okay, that's it. I hope that helps. It serves as a nice introduction and hope to get into more discussion with everyone later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynette. Uh, so let me just bring in uh, Dr. Lam. Uh, Dr. Lam, to share your thoughts on the circular economy in the Singapore's context. Yeah, thanks, uh, Aslam. Again, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good to be here and uh, really honored uh, to be asked to, to join uh, today's uh, discussion. I'll only say a, a, a few words, really. And to be honest, if you look at uh, the, the audience, I see a lot of experts in here as well couple of professors, people that I rec uh, uh, look up to a lot. So I don't claim any technical expertise. I'm just a plant ecologist really and involved in nature conservation. But I suppose what, what I'd like to discuss later when, when we get um, a chance to maybe answer some questions is to see at some point how to bridge this sort of tech, tech uh, lifestyle, lifestyle. So that's something that we can do uh, using sort of um, technology uh, to improve efficiencies, to be able to recycle some of these and reuse some of these materials better. So that's that part, which I, th I think uh, Singapore is very well placed to contribute to directly because we do have the expertise. But then there are these other issues uh, that, in fact, Prof. Uh, Lynette Chia just mentioned, how, how do we address these uh, social issues, um, income disparities, resource uh, disparities, access to uh, materials, how to, you know, because really this has to be a kind of global, integrated, holistic approach, and it can't be single countries sort of taking this on. And this is maybe something that doesn't come as naturally to us because we are really just a kind of small urban country. And how do we become part of the solution to these broader global societal issues? And then the last thing would be, of course, nature. Um, when things so the Singapore circular economy discussion really can't just be about Singapore, in my opinion, because the footprint that we leave is actually someplace else. It's, some, it's somebody else's forest, somebody else's coral reef, somebody else's karst landscape that's ground up to, to make light, you know, to make cement and everything. And so I think it really, we have to 
And it's difficult because we don't have that hinterland, but somehow to be able to envision that whole landscape level or regional or even global level impact, and then to use our many strengths in, in, in engineering and technology, in finance, in education, in communication. And we have also a very vigorous, uh, lots of expertise in nature as well, because nature, I think, also needs to be part of that solution, because if we can't maintain the integrity of wild systems that provide the life support that makes all life on Earth possible, then we're in trouble. So I guess the idea is how to take all of these different disparate parts and to integrate it and um, and how can Singapore become part of that solution? Be very exciting to discuss some of these with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lam. Okay, wonderful. So we have heard the perspective of the, an academic. We have heard the perspective of uh, the leader of an NGO, the Nature Society. Let's perhaps take time to hear the perspective from a corporation. So can I invite uh, Esther to share your thoughts on the circular economy, Esther? Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me and, uh, you know, to share the CDL story and also the uh, as an individual, you know, um, uh, we heard about the Paris Agreement, the national, you know, determined, you know, uh, 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 a commitment to Paris Agreement and also talk about the 1.5 degree business, you know, uh, ambition that UN has been advocating. Uh, CDL started our sustainability journey as far back as 1995 when nobody really talked about climate change or global warming by, at that time. So, but now today, uh, in fact, every business is expected to do good while, you know, do well financially. You have to, you know, not at the expense of the community or the climate uh, or the environment. So this is almost a uh, given now. But uh, now what exactly that can drive circular economy is really about people, about mindset, about behavior. And I do not totally agree that only businesses can really endorse, you know, uh, embrace this circular economy. It takes the whole global, you know, uh, commitments to solve this uh, global uh, climate challenges. And now, of course, we also add on to the challenge is the, the, the health issue, pandemic issues and all that. So I think, uh, personally, I think circular economy is definitely a powerful enabler for us to even work towards the 2030 goals, whether it is the climate goals or the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDG in shorts. There are 17 goals, 159 targets. A lot of companies are being expected to actually embrace the relevant uh, goals and targets into their business, such as I think for today's uh, topic, the most relevant one is goal number 12, which is a responsible and a sustainable consumption and production. So like the previous speaker talked about, you know, you look at the whole life cycle. Okay, circular economy is not at the end points that you talk about recycling. They have to go back to the source. And uh, for us, we are also set a lot of targets about like climate, uh, you know, carbon emission. And we look at embody, you know, carbon, which is the scope three. Embody carbon is basically talking about what are the materials that you use up, you know, the upstream, what are the sourcing of your materials that will contribute to the uh, embodied carbon. So for us, actually, we are uh, quite uh, take pride that we have committed to uh, SPTI, the science-based target uh, uh, carbon emission uh, targets as far back as 2018. So we also want uh, the earliest uh, Singapore real estate companies to commit to 1.5 with the UN uh, uh, Global Compact last year. In September, I was there at the Climate Action Week. We committed to 1.5 degree and a business of pension, which is not going to be easy, but circular economy is one of the enabler. And we look at the whole life cycle upstream sourcing and then, you know, the design and how do we extend the use of resources and how do we not just talking about recycling, but also remanufacture, reintroduce the, the resources back to the whole loop of cycle. And I think this will really require a whole concept change of what is waste. We don't look at waste as like garbage not worthwhile type of garbage. You have to look at it as like, how do we, you know, uh, 
reintroduce it, remanufacture it, and bring it back to the whole cycle. And I think uh, we all know about plastic, you know, the packaging and all that. You know, over the last 13 years, we actually produce almost, you know, 90% of plastic, you know, the whole world has been, you know, a uh, 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 half today. And only 10% are being recycled, and uh, a lot of them go to our ocean. You know, we, we heard about all the horror story about Pacific Waste Patch growing as big as the whole France, you know, the, the whole country. So I think uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do, but it requires a lot of you know human commitment. It requires leadership commitment, uh, whether it is the you know political leader or business leader, and even the you know consumers, because consumers are the key drivers and what you expect of the product and also packaging. I think you know just on a personal basis, like you know almost ten years ago, I started to give you know a, a Christmas present without wrapping. Of course, all the children were not very happy, you know. So that represents the consumer's, you know, behavior. They all expect like beautiful gift wrap, beautiful ribbon, you know, for every Christmas present. And they always com complain about your, your present is more bo most boring and not surprising, you know, I can see what is it. So I think you need to change this mindset and consumer can play a major role. If you expect everything to be well packaged or over packaged, then you can't save the world from you know being being swarmed with a lot of garbage and a lot of waste. Yeah. So I can stop here first. Maybe we can continue the discussion. Okay, very good, very good. Um all right. So thank you so much, Lynette, uh, Prof Chia, and of course Dr. Lam for sharing your thoughts. And this is just the initial high level for us to get an understanding of what circular economy is, what are the issues. So Obviously, the circular economy seems very compelling. And, um, but, you know, if we look at Singapore's context, uh, we have, you know, you could say that in the past, we have done a lot, you know, through our tree planting initiatives. You know, Singapore being a small country, we always look to conserve and, and optimize our resources. Uh, but this concept of circularity is still new, and we are just starting in this movement. And I guess from our research, uh, the Zero Waste Master Plan is probably, uh, in my view, and I stand corrected, the most comprehensive one that talks about how we encapsulate circularity uh, in, in managing waste. Um, but really, why are we not having, seeing more adoption in the circular economy principles across, not just in corporations, but in you know, government organizations and even in the consumer? What do you think are some of the challenges uh, that we are facing in the adoption of the circular economy principles. So, which any of the panelists wish to start? Maybe uh, Professor Chia, you want to start the ball rolling on this question? Mm, that's a very million dollar question, right? So, this, this concept is so attractive. I think everyone agrees it's, it's valuable, but how come it's so difficult? Um, I think there's a lot of economics also that goes into it. I mean, to, to have to, you know, to, it's it's for for businesses sometimes it's it's tough when you to to make it economic viable to 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 take back products to refurbish it and all that when there's another business model where which promotes you know uh, selling more more units rather than refurbishing I, I mean just to give an example I, I I broke my handphone screen my smartphone screen once and then the the cost of repairing that screen was a lot more than you know. Re, re, uh, getting a new phone, uh, so it's it's um, th there are barriers. Uh, I think uh, business model barriers, but uh, but I see everyone has a role to play. I mean, I see one of the questions. You know, what what can all of us uh, at different levels, you know, do to to help to help with this? I think it has to do with um, it, consumer decisions. I think drives it. Like like what Esther was mentioning, uh, if if we have choices to make, I think we can uh, always opt for 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 one that we know. You know. Um, from the academic point of view, I think it's also helpful to put out, you know, different studies or different, um, like uh, primers of, you know, for, for, for different product types, you know, how do we best make decisions for, for, for consumers, you know, when I purchase something, uh, how do I evaluate the, the, the overall impact and what alternatives there are to, to, to guide us. So, uh, and then and in between all of that is also this interaction between all these different stakeholders. I mean, when I when I push out papers, it's not just to push out a paper, right? I have to make sure that it connects with someone who can then apply what we find out or or, or things like that. So yeah, it's not not an easy question. Yeah. So um, thank you. Actually, I want to bring this to 
uh, Esther, and, and you mentioned that in 1995, since 1995, CDL has actually started to really look at sustainability. Um, so you have a lot of experience in this. So maybe we can learn from some of CDL's experience, you know, uh, how did you start and what were some of the actions you took that led you to perhaps, you know, being bold enough to say we are, we are ready and confident to commit to that 1.5% uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement? 1.5 degree. One yeah, five okay. Degree. Well, how we started is, uh, I mean, we didn't have the crystal ball in the 90s. And uh, what we feel is like, um, in fact, that was the time I joined uh, the industry, you know, 1990, 1995. And thanks to my uh, late mentor, Mr. Kwa Ling Chiu, and uh, when he interviewed me, he, he asked me a question, what do you think about the construction industry? You know, what do you think about the environmental impact? So being a layman and a home, you know, um, a, a owner, I just say that, well, it's not exactly very positive to the environment and construction sites are normally you know have like you know you associate with water noise and dust and, and all that so and, and true enough during a that time, the construction industry was not exactly considered as very eco-friendly and that was how we actually confronted and then decided that we have to establish an ethos to confront this, you know, uh, uh, this, this perception and we want to change it to one that conserving as we construct. That was how we started the whole journey and uh, what we did is like we really feel that we have to change the, the model and how do we make uh, building design, building construction, you know, and management more environmental friendly and uh, more positive to the community. And of course, you know, the, at the, you know, at the end of the day, we, we want this to benefit the whole uh, planet as well. So even up to today, as you know, that uh, building and construction industry collectively, you know, contribute 39% of greenhouse gas emission worldwide. And uh, it need not to be the, you know, you're, you may not be in the construction or, or building or real estate industry, but you are a homeowner, you use buildings, you use, you know, uh, uh, F&B outlets, hotels and all that. So, and uh, studies show that uh, about 90% of people's time in average spend indoor. So how you can, you know, change as a user also can, you know, in fact, uh, impact about 50% of a building performance, whether at home or in commercial office or, you know, in an in industrial building or, you know, or even how you travel. So at the end of the day, it's like we need to enlarge a bigger, you know, uh, uh, the so-called ecosystem from the you know public sectors to you know designer architect uh, engineer to supply chain how do we you know align our expectation of course everybody say that yeah 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 we need to go green you know yeah, climate change is you know is is a real threat and devastating to human you know humanity everybody knows about it but it's like whether people really take action so what i believe in as a practitioner is uh, awareness drive adoption and drive action. If you are not aware, and you will just say that, oh, well, doesn't matter, La Singapore is so small, you know, 0 0.1, you know, 1% 1, 1 of the overall, you know, greenhouse gas in the whole world, what can I do? And even, even, you know, as an individual, whether I switch on the aircon 24 hours, doesn't matter, you know, whether I throw away a lot of garbage, doesn't matter. But I think if everybody thinks that way, you know, uh, our world will be doomed. So what we, as a, you know, as, as a corporate, what we do is we have direct impact on our supply chain. So, uh, you know, for more than, you know, close to two decades, we have the so-called YHS policy, environment, health and safety. We also established uh, in the late 2000, 2008, if I'm not mistaken, we have a responsible and green procurement policy. So what are the do's and don'ts that, that we, we uh, guide our main contractor, what they should use and what they should not use. And of course, circular economy is relatively a very new concept. So uh, of course, we, when we set the target for our uh, carbon emission, we also look at embodied carbon. We also look at what are the suppliers, you know, contributions to our, you know, uh, uh, scope three uh, uh, body carbon. So we have to engage supplier. We really have to set targets. Like for example, uh, in the building industry, the biggest um, 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 building materials that we use are like uh, steel and concrete. So these are the two big ticket items. And we want to look at that to set targets, how we could actually help to really drive, move the needle. Yeah, we can't do everything, but at least look at something that you can create a bigger impact. Uh, like for example, steel, we have actually raised the targets to 60 to 80% of steel that we use are uh, recycled steel. And of course, not to worry about quality, definitely those are 
uh, no compromise on qualities and, and standard. But it is like you can definitely recycle construction material. There is a lot of potential. It's just that you need to have the mindset. You need to uh, design and plan and procure with you know the commitment. If you just talk and no action, if you don't set targets and you don't track targets and you don't track impact, it's only remaining about talking only. So I think this is what businesses should do to set target, to track and report and uh, being transparent about the adoption and all the, you know, the impact as well. And engaging, you know, your supply chain, your whole value chain, you know, from, from uh, public sector, you know, financial investors to all your whole supply chain is very important. And of course, consumer, I always believe that consumer can really drive change. Uh, Dr. Lam, I just want to bring you in to share your perspective on also these challenges that we face. Perhaps in your, in your view, you, you are focused more on biodiversity. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on some of the challenges to adopt circular economy? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Aslam. I mean, again, uh, on the technical things, I, I defer to the other experts here in the audience and the panelists. But I, I think, um, you know, there is really... Um, a talk. In fact, now in Singapore, we have a recently established uh, Center for Nature-Based Solutions for, for Climate based at NUS, headed by uh, Professor uh, Ko Lien Pin, who's returned to Singapore, and he's building a team there. And of course, that, you know, so, so many of you, for example, would have seen the uh, last year's National Day rally, wasn't it, where our Prime Minister talked about uh, uh, climate change as an existential threat to Singapore, which, which it really is. And then out came a, a potential uh, solutions in, in terms of how do we deal with uh, r rising climate and uh, uh, rising sea levels, I'm sorry. And, and I thought uh, many people saw that, myself included, and got very excited. But then um, a, a number of people also said, wait, wait a minute, this is all really hard kind of engineering type solutions. Where were the mangroves? Where were some of the natural systems that might be part of an overall solution? And of course, to be to be fair to Prime Minister, these are just sort of provisional um, ideas being thrown out. It wasn't the finalized plan, but I guess the idea is really how can a green infrastructure become integrated into this circular economy so that the two are uh, synergized? I mean, there, there are awesome examples uh, uh, quite a number of years ago, I think, and, and a well-meaning thing too, which was the European Union uh, mandated by a certain year, I think 10% of all uh, uh, fuels had to be uh, plant derived or some sort of biofuel. And, and then that, that created, generated a lot of excitement here in Southeast Asia because this would provide a market for palm oil, which can be an excellent biofuel. In fact, diesel engines were first designed to uh, burn plant-based oils. But on the other hand, if you really thought about the footprint of palm oil and in the way it's much of it is uh, derived from cleared peat swamps, which have a huge carbon footprint, um, it turns out that actually it was a great net carbon input into the into the um, atmosphere and nothing's not circular at all. So I guess that the, the thing is really nature and infrastructure, not just biodiversity. I mean, biodiversity comes as part of the package and, and leads to resilient ecosystems. But how does, how, how can we have all of these technical fixes without eating into that natural capital, uh, I, I think is the big challenge. And uh, luckily, I think we, we might have just generated enough interest in, in the nick of time so that we might be able to kind of avert um, natural habitat degradation and, and, and kick in some of these technical and um, economic fixes as well. Very good. Okay, I think it's a good time for me to start um, getting the audience's questions in play because uh, I see some uh, quite a good number of questions coming in. So I just want to uh, start off at the top. Uh, we have uh, Luther Liang, uh, his questions to the panelists. And I think, uh, Annette, you tried to answer some of that. And probably, Esther, you have addressed quite comprehensively the CDL's uh, component. Uh, what can individuals, civil society, business, academia, and government, uh, what role can they play to contribute to implementing circular economy projects in Singapore? So I think, uh, Esther, you answered very well the CDS perspective, uh, how you tackle it through procurement, uh, through policy and guiding your suppliers. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, uh, from uh, the, the, the part about individuals we touched on lightly, uh, what about government? 
who would like to take that question? No, I would just say, uh, give, it, give, it, give it a give shot. It a shot. Actually, okay. uh, we have been committed to public and private uh, people partnership for many years. And, uh, and uh, we actually opened the Singapore Sustainability Academy in 2017 June, which is a partnership with six government agencies. And we built and designed and, uh, and of course, we managed the, the, the Zero Energy Academy. And uh, of course, we also engaged about 12 uh, industry partners, you know, uh, including Warhub, including a lot of, you know, uh, big name like uh, Schneider and uh, on and on, they come up with a design that can achieve zero energy and we actually make use of like uh, solar panels to uh, op uh, uh, to support the whole operation since 2017 it has been operating uh, purely uh, on solar energy and so I think uh, definitely there will be a good result uh, with partnership, which is also SDG, you know, partnership number 17, uh, with more people come on board contributing, whether in kind, in cash, in idea, in resources, uh, we can achieve a lot more. Yeah, so I think uh, if you want specific, and uh, for the academy, we actually generated about 60,000 kilowatt hour per year. And uh, we only consume about 50,000, you know, uh, kilowatt hour, you know, uh, for the operations. So the excess, we didn't go to waste. We actually ch uh, channel it back to our city square mall where the academy is located at. So these are the specific examples that you can engage the public sector, private sector, and also people sector. And uh, since we opened until end of last year, before, you know, a uh, uh, circuit uh, break, uh, breaker, we actually have... Uh, hosted or organized 370 over events and training courses, which is in partnership with us. Uh, most of it are in partnership with uh, SEAS, which is the Sustainable Energy Association Singapore, which have a partnership with ADB, Asian Development Bank, to promote uh, sustainable energies and solution uh, with our professional in Singapore as well as in the ASEAN region. So we look at education, we look at training, capacity building, networking, and we provide free space for NGOs, and, and, and partners to host their events, whether it is engaging women. We have a Women uh, for Green Network, which has been uh, really active. We touch on uh, topics like sustainable fashion, sustainable you know, uh, uh, um, diet, and also ecotourism. You have to introduce ideas and, uh, and uh, inspire people to drive change at home, at work, and at play. So we engage women. We also engage youth as well, so apart from businesses and the industry. Wow, very good. Very comprehensive, in fact. <laughs> okay, I have one question here for Lynette. Uh, I'm just going to jump about uh, and, and pick questions as, it, as I see them. So one question is uh, I'm to Lynette by Bobby Ying Chuan, Bobby Tan. Uh, I noticed you have not considered CO2 removal and utilization in a, C in a circular economy. Is it not necessary in your opinion? Can we achieve the 2C target just by reducing resource usage globally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Bobby. Um, yeah, uh, I think this relates to, in general, uh, end, of, end of life treatment options. Uh, so when we generate waste and emissions, you know, like what can we do about it? So, you know, in terms of solid waste, you know, it's landfilling, incineration, and so on. In terms of uh, CO2 emissions, you know, there are different technologies that are being considered now for, for, for removing this from our environment and atmosphere, how to best how to best do that. In terms of whether we think it's part of the solutions, I think at this stage, everything is part of the solution that we're trying to pursue as long as it's economically viable and you know everyone is, is, is on board. So, um, but, but managing resource consumption, I feel is the strong, has the strongest leverage. So if we were to deal with the, uh, again, how do we achieve the, uh, the, the question of, you know, how do we achieve a good quality of life while minimizing uh, re resource consumption, can we ever balance that and find find this this way of, of doing it? Um, is, is, I, I, would, I would say it would be key to achieving the, the target. Yeah. But we need all so all possible solutions, including this. Okay. Uh, one question from Stefan. Stefan Words, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, the cornerstone of the circular economy is life cycle analysis, and that takes into account resources used and how the end product is disposed of after its final use. Can we expect the business community to do this? Or shouldn't there be blueprints developed by experts that can be adopted by industries uh, sectors? So um, 
Mm -hmm. Open to any of the panelists that wish to attend this question. Yeah, maybe I can I can try try to address this. Uh, life cycle assessment is indeed uh, valuable. I've seen initiatives where the companies and businesses themselves are quite keen to do this on their own. So, for example, Volkswagen has come out with a life cycle assessment of the Volkswagen Golf every time a new model is put out. You know, um, so some of this is business led, but um, but there are also a lot of tools that are available uh, for the different industries. So, like construction and and and, and building industry would have some. LCA tools as well. Um, so these are available. Uh, I've seen also many LCA studies that are led by academics. You know, I've led some myself also. Um, so I, I think it's, 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 it's it, I guess the, the tools available is, is whether like who wants to make use of it, how do we make use of it, how does that help the businesses uh, in, in, in the work that they do and, and, and so on. So, so I think it's a mix, yeah. Okay, very good. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, one question from uh, uh, Git Yet, Ong Git Yen, Gin Yet. Uh, how can society, government, MNCs, SMEs be encouraged to actively take part in sustainability rather than more discussions, i.e. less motherhood statements needed? So I, who wants to go for that? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just try. Yeah, I'll just be, be real quick on this one, and hopefully that Prof Chia and uh, Esther can also um, chime in. I, I think uh, just going back to the procurement question that you answered, Esther. I mean, there are some. And it is difficult, but I, and and of course, if you talk about a country like Monaco, very small and rather wealthy, um, it maybe it's a different uh, scale from from a even from a country like Singapore, which has many more people. But on the other hand, Monaco has has done a few things. For example, like procuring timber from only sustainable, sustainably uh, uh, produced um, uh, plantations, for example. I think they, 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 they have, they've been able to ban certain kinds of seafood that are clearly endangered from the Mediterranean, like the uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna. The, these things aren't, aren't, aren't procured by the government. And I think when the government takes, the public sector takes the lead on some of the sustainable procurement, then that sets a standard for the rest of industry to follow. I don't know how practical that is, because I know I've been to enough talks that Esther has given and that some for sometimes oftentimes the consumer just wants sort of the price as the bottom line and is not sometimes too keen to pay to pay an additional amount just to make sure that the thing was sustainable if, if I if I learned correctly from you um, Esther but um, yeah no I, I do think policy and discussions are important but I think having some maybe some flagship uh, pr projects that really demonstrate how it's possible to achieve some sort of um, nature and resource use uh, balance or where or synergies. Uh, and, and there are such things. I mean, for example, uh, a, a new train line in, in, in the in the in South, uh, I think in the greater London area where they actually took the took the uh, soil from the from the tunneling and they were able to create um, wetlands, uh, artificial wetlands for um, to restore wetlands for migratory birds, a, a great success. It was URail working with the RSPB, the Royal Society for P the Protection of Bir uh, Birds, um, taking mine mines and rehabilitating them to create wetlands again. So as some sort of remediation, you, you couldn't ne necessarily re revert that back to the original uh, habitat, but to create a, rather than sort of wasteland uh, areas that had great recreational and biodiversity value. So again, creating something um, that otherwise could have been really a sterile, um, uh, unusable uh, land for, for nature or for people. I should turn this one over. Very Esther good, and very Prof. good. Yeah. Okay, I just want to encourage the, uh, before we move on, I'm gonna encourage the audience, you know, if you have questions, put a raised hand. I know I see one, but I thought I'll just bring it, uh, you would, Dr. Lam, you passed the, the ball to Esther and, and, and <laughs> so let you answer that question before we go to the audience. To make sense. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, you all talk, uh, heard about like green building for many, many years already. And I think this is a very good example that uh, BCA, you know, as a government agency set very high standard of uh, green building standard and uh, in also consultation with uh, 
uh, industry as well. And uh, since it is launched in 2005 until now, there have been five or six versions already. And uh, every two years, they raise the bar on, you know, uh, not just about the design, the ventilation, you know, and uh, material use. And apart from uh, energy efficiency is the key of uh, green building. And uh, of course, now we also talk about health and well-being. Uh, to consumers, honestly, they are not interested to look at, you know, the how many hundreds of indicator of green mark. To them, it's like, oh, okay, it is a, a, a mandatory anyway, you know, uh, for the green mark certification level, but they don't really know that there is certification level gold, gold plus and platinum, and how, you know, the platinum level is 30% more efficient, you know, in terms of energy uh, uh, consumption than the others, you know. So, uh, like you said, when uh, when you make a decision to buy a, a home, you know, which is a, a lot million dollars, you know, investment, you look at location. You look at always look at location, location. And even if you are East Coast person, no matter how green, I have one project in the, on the West Coast, I can't pull you over the East Coast if your kids are studying there or whatever. So I think it need a long term type of education and engagement. And uh, now we are seeing actually some light in the tunnel. A lot of more the younger, especially the more eco savvy you know, uh, consumers, they, d they do uh, appreciate, you know, some of the features that come with this, for example, you know, the recycling uh, facility, the lower, you know, uh, energy, you know, the uh, uh, higher uh, energy efficient, you know, fittings. And uh, if you give, want to give example to show how, you know, uh, green building can be done, net zero building can be done. Of course, we have built, you know, like uh, just now I mentioned about Sustainability Academy, uh, close to 90% of the material used are cross laminated timber. Or lamp, you know, or uh, glue laminated timber, which is uh, certified from the most sustainable uh, forest source. And uh, at the Botanic Garden, we also built, uh, actually, uh, we call it the City of Green Gallery, which is also net zero building. And then the wall that we used was actually hemcrete, not the normal, you know, uh, concrete, which is a bio-based, you know, uh, 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 concrete that make, uh, comprises hemp plant, water, and lime, which is a very, you know, uh, very fitting for a, a garden setting. So there are examples that the best example is that when you see that, oh, this is a net zero building, okay, at least the consumer can see it and touch it and feel it and understand how is the making of this. It is a combination of material design and also solar energy and also the usage as well to keep the, you know, the operations at the more optimal level. Uh, so I think there are a lot of, you know, examples you can look at, but of course in Singapore being lens gas, uh, land for renewable energy for solar panel is very limited and you have to if you want to do into this topic that it, 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 it will be another three hours so i think we we have to look at how we can make use of renewable energy and of course you also look at you know how do you offset you know not to buy your steam but at least you can you know make use of like rec uh, renewable energy certifications to offset some of the you know uh, uh, energy consumptions that you have in, uh, uh, incurred so there are a lot a lot of uh, innovation technology today that you can help to lower the carbon footprint of businesses yeah mm. wonderful uh, I'm just going to bring it bring in uh, the audience I see two hands being raised uh, I'll start off with Maurice since you start your hand was raised for quite a bit so Maurice you can unmute and ask your questions hello Maurice Okay, never mind. I'll move on to Sean Trewick. Sean? Hi, thank you very much uh, for taking my question. I'm calling from Melbourne, Australia. And I was just curious to ask the panel what, um, what policy has been put in place in terms to incentivize the investment into the circular economy? A bit of a broad question, but we're seeing here in Victoria that government's putting $300 million to really catalyze this. So it'd be interesting to see what's happening in Singapore. Thanks. So, uh, Esther, Lynette, Sean, <laughs> what are some of the broad policies? 
Uh, well, I can't answer. I'm, I'm not a government spokesman, but I think there are definitely policies that can, you know, encourage and, uh, you know, incentivize. Uh, if you're talking about green mark and, and all that, there is actually definitely some incentives in terms of uh, growth floor area. And, and I think uh, now, uh, just less than two weeks ago, we have actually renamed the, uh, the Ministry for the Envi of the Environment to Ministry of Sustainability and, and the Environment. So we are all excited to look forward to you know uh, more uh, policies and more action uh, to the, to address sustainability issues on a more strategic basis and also how to engage the you know different sectors to do so uh, that there are also various type of uh, you know uh, incentive you know to promote uh, uh, energy efficiency or solar panels and uh, renewables such as the national you know research foundation i don't think there is one that actually is just you know, committed to broad sense of sustainability. It has to be like, you know, looking at like, you know, NEA, look at more like the environmental, like food waste. We are partnering uh, uh, NEAs to look at how do we uh, reduce food waste, turn re uh, food waste into compost. We have started this study for two years now. Um, so we are sharing costs in that. And we are also working with a series, which is the uh, Sustainable Energy Research Institute Singapore, uh, together with some fund from research foundations to look at the new generations of uh, uh, BIPV, which is the building integrated uh, uh, PV solar panel. So there are a lot of things uh, uh, happening, but I don't, uh, not that I'm aware of that there is one particular incentive that is, is you know, in general looking at, you know, sustainable de uh, development itself. It actually fall into various, you know, uh, government agencies, but with now the new setup of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Sustainability and the Environment, we are looking forward to something a little bit more on the consolidated uh, background and uh, I mean on basis and uh, hopefully we can see more action. So I mean, may I just jump in very quickly, Aslam, yep. on this one? It, it, I mean, it's an interesting thing and maybe it's a little bit um, off, 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 tan uh, off tangent here, but um, you know, there's certain things, I mean, it's not so much maybe circular economy, but how do you address these issues of footprint? So let's say foot, footprint from food production. And if you actually look at any kind of, if I mean, we, we, we're Asian society, we live near the sea, seafood is a big part of our, not only tradition, you know, our heritage, but it's also a big part of our diet. But then if you look at any kind of sustainability, a seafood sustain, you know, sustainable seafood guide is horrifying because most of what we eat is at least as, as far as people have assessed it is really un unsustainable. So what is sustainable? Uh, mussels from New Zealand, uh, tilapia grown in aquaculture. I mean, there's a, it's a handful of stuff, not none of them local. So and then the, then the question becomes, well, it's easy. Why don't we just put in, in, into place some f fishing regulations and monitor this, uh, monitor and, and regulate our shared fishery sustainably. So now then it becomes a kind of a regional uh, problem. And then, so if, and then if maybe we're worried because we have no hinterland really to produce our own food. And even if we aggressively go 30% by 2030, that's, there's still that big shortfall where all of our food is going to be imported. So to take that brave step to say all of our food should come from uh, sustainable sources wherever possible is maybe um, uh, a step too far, at least for a regulator like the, the government, but it could be something that's Oof. done uh, driven by public sector, private sector, sorry, and, and individual consumers. So, I mean, it is possible, but, but here it's a case of there has to be at a broader scale, uh, regional level cooperation, as well as kind of not, not necessarily everything led by the government, because in some cases, I think they're not in a position where they, they can. Okay. So I see Maurice, your hand is back up. So you want to pose your question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, this basically, uh, looking at your panel, there's nobody who's taking a different view. Like, you know, is this 2% really science, exact science, or just consensus? Uh, I saw uh, Professor Leonard's uh, chart that shows sudden increase in consumption of, uh, of uh, resources since 1900. I just Googled 1900, we had only 1.6 billion people. Uh, now there's 7 billion people. So maybe we should have less people 
and then we don't have so much consumption of resources. And just another question, you, you're worried about landfilling, but haven't it didn't we extract all these things from, from the ground? Uh, oil gave us plastic bags and plastic items. Shouldn't we just put it back into the ground? Or any other uh, steel that's from iron ore? Putting it back in the ground is not a bad idea after all. It's, it came from the ground. So just a couple of questions to uh, have a different point of view because I, I'm quite concerned about this question of sustainability. It's, it's not very well defined and uh, we tried to make a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not very clear about this, but a lot of these things are quite pseudoscience in a lot of ways that we are, uh, we are just adopting things that have a, uh, that we all been taught that this is, should be the case. We don't have a, a point of view that's a bit different so that people can have different, I mean, that's the point about having discussions that we must have different people having different points of view. Okay. But I look at the panel here, it's all, uh, you know, they ha all have the homo uh, homogeneous view. Yeah. So. So, okay, Maurice, so your question, Maurice, is that uh, as population has increased, the consumption of uh, resources has naturally increased. So, uh, I guess a uh, way to look at it is, uh, you know, in relative terms, right? Uh, are we being more efficient and more sustainable now compared to the past? So, I'm not sure if, the, if there's any research being done there. I stand corrected, but I welcome the panel to just comment. Just a, another, idea, sorry, yeah. another, another, just to extend it, uh, yeah. the, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide level we have is now about 440 parts per million. Mm. Uh, you know, back in the, uh, it was 200 odd parts per million, I think in, in the early 1900s. And uh, for, for plants to subsist, you need about 180 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. In a room, if we have a conference in a room, our, the, the air quality will go up to about 2,000 parts per million CO2, CO2 content. So we are all this talk about CO2 and, and you know, the, what is the, the amount that's really good for us, I think that's up for dispute anyway. Okay. So a contrarian view, I guess, uh, from the science that is coming out from, from the market. So um, anyone want to... I mean, I, I would say, I would say uh, good, good question, Maurice. So then the question is, what is it, what is it that we know and what is, what is debatable? And so I think it, it, as far as the, the, the climate, the link between, say, CO2 levels and, and warming climate, I mean, and, and, and is our... Un is the data and and models uh, improve? The amount of data increases. The models improve, and of course, Lynette Chia, Prof Chia is on this uh, IPCC report as an editor, so you can say more about it. But I think we're able to fine tune these models. I think we have a pretty good idea of estimating quite accurately uh, how. how the amount of CO2 that increases in the atmosphere will lead to a certain degree of warming. And in fact, I was just reading somewhere where uh, uh, last week a paper came out of a, um, a lab at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And greatly, the, the thing is, there's a lot of, there's maybe some uncertainty. So there was, you know, the question is if we double CO2 rates, I think estimates in, uh, were saying anywhere from 1.5 to 4.5 degrees would be the, the warming. But now I think with the refined models, it looks like it will be quite a bit more than 1.5. So the, the, it's a narrow, narrower range of uncertainty. 2.6 to 4 degrees is, is the likely, and, and there's a pretty good, um, um, uh, it, it was quite a rigorous study. So I, I think in terms of like, yes, we have a homogeneous view, which is I think we're going to have to um, really reduce CO2 emissions and use resources much more in a more enlightened and thoughtful way to to avoid sort of really bad 
the worst possible uh, outcomes, which will be disastrous for future generations. Maybe where there is some, not necessarily the difference of opinion, but we come from different perspectives. So I think this might be a whole range of solutions. And I suppose, you know, you, you could have any number of solutions and, and we, we could take one extreme where we say, okay, we're gonna go back to those days of limiting, um, of, of, you know, a sort of a extreme family planning type approach to bring down population level. Um, or you've seen the science fiction, like the movie Soylent Green, you have a great life, but then once you hit a certain age, you get sent to the incinerator and that's it. And that's the way of capping. I mean, there, there are all these different views and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to uh, ridicule anything, but to say that I suppose where people will dif differ, I hope where people differ is that they have offer a wide range of solutions, but where I hope people don't differ is in the, uh, urgency of the situation where if we really keep messing around with uh, certain environmental parameters um, it's not a, that's not a matter of opinion that's that's that that that's you know in, in the same way um, if you do x you will get y i think the the community is 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 um developing a much more fine-tuned understanding of this it, 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 i mean correct me if i'm wrong uh lynette or uh, esther yeah, yeah, I definitely f fully agree with, with Sean. Um, but then again, we represent a, a very similar view. But but I definitely welcome the, the deferring thoughts. But I think the one thing to, to make note about these scenarios and 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 the reports that are are coming out of uh, you know the IPCC, they're they're meant to be uh, based on 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 science. So it's it's a it's a, it's in effect like the a global scientific literature review, you know, and the reports that I put out, they are basically summaries of the current state of science, along with all the uncertainties associated with it, which sometimes might be more challenging to, to therefore interpret uh, uh, quickly and, 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 and think about it. So, that, that, I mean, this is where it does not deny that there's uncertainty associated with these models, but I think some of the, the basis, uh, the, the, the fundamentals of, you know, the, the causes of uh, uh, anthropogenic causes of, of, of climate change and all that is there, so there's, there's no dispute uh, in, in that regard, yeah. I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Esther and uh, Lynette. Maurice, I was just going back to your point about um, amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. And there is there are some question marks, for example, and this is where, where people are trying to do research to understand it. If the, um, if the CO2 gets above a certain point, how will tropical forests, for example, react to elevated CO2? And some people say that it, it'd be like fertilizer. There's more fertilizer, they'll grow faster, absorb more CO2. And others will say, well, actually, um, the uh, warming temperatures will actually slow down their growth. So forests will become a net uh, carbon source as opposed to a carbon sink. And a lot of the climate models really need to understand how forests will behave in a warmer and elevated CO2 type world. And so there, uh, to be honest, there still are question marks. But it's not a question of the, the question is how will these systems behave, and so that's a that's a, that's an issue. Then how do the models? How can the models be refined by what we know uh, happening on the ground? So um, yeah, so so there are these things that we have I think identified the gaps that need to be filled to make these models a little bit more sensitive, if, from what I understand. Okay, Catherine, I see your hand is up. You want to pose your question? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much uh, for sharing with us today. Uh, I have two questions. The first question will be like, um, we understand that um, humans are like um, hurting the planet and um, we are like killing the forest. And um, there's a distinction between um, nature versus us human. But is that, um, I wanted to know like, how near are we to like coexist together in terms of, I'm thinking along a line of like green building, um, having like um, to replicate the kind of like um, nature in our house. And um, that could be a more sustainable way instead of like, um, let's say doing a restoration of, of a whole patch of forest. Uh, that's something just uh, off my head. And, um, and also let's say um, if we could like maybe grow our own vegetable yeah, um, that could be a more sustainable way um, in each of our household, yeah, um, in terms of food production. And then moving on, the second question will be, the challenge is that for circular economy is to strike a balance between um, energy uh, economy and social uh, sustainability or even viability. Because most of the time we want to do like recycling, 
But um, as what um, Prof Cha had mentioned earlier, the cost might be one of the factor. So like how best can we do and in order to get like the buy-in from the government, how best the industry could support and how us as an individual could help um, to contribute to, towards this circular economy. Uh, okay, okay, I so think uh, I can address your first question. Sorry, I have to unmute first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Catherine. And uh, well, from a developer's perspective, maybe I can share like, you know, how do we design a buildings or residential development that it is closer to, you know, uh, uh, nature or, you know. So um, I think uh, Landscape, softscape, you know, and, and all that has been always been our focus in our residential development. Uh, mandatory requirement is 40% of site areas to be devoted to landscape and, uh, you know, uh, uh, facility. And uh, for most of our development, we devote more than that. And, uh, you know, the uh, Amber Park, you know, the, along the East Coast, we devote about 64%, you know, for uh, people to, you know, uh, uh, get together. It's a lot more like a communal type of uh, 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 lifestyle. And uh, luxe landscape is always a focus for us because everybody, you know, uh, find peace when they are surrounded with the you know, greenery, greenery and all that. And uh, But I also want to mind you to share with you something interesting. It's like um, in 2009, I think we completed the... the um, uh, tree house condominium and uh, along dairy farm and it actually have a you know 28 floor, uh, story high of a vertical uh, garden we call it it's actually a vertical green wall so uh, there are a lot of uh, quite a lot of residents actually appreciate it because it actually helped to uh, cool down the you know the, the 48 units behind this uh, green wall but there are also some don't like it because there are a lot of creepy crawly a lot of insect a lot of you know you know uh, 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 flying around or you know so there are also a lot of different views, you know, for, but we are there to like really come up with the design that can really uh, good for the, for the project and also, you know, good for the environment. And uh, more and more now, especially the younger generation or even the more mature ones, they, they like facilities such as like, um, you know, community farming, herbal garden, you know, and uh, agricube, which we actually provided uh, facility for them to grow vegetable. So more and more, you know, such facilities are actually in store for design for our residential development already. So I think uh, uh, NPAC is also promoting, you know, um, uh, vertical gardening, you know, biofilms design. So I think uh, moving forward, you will see that there are more, there will be more such, you know, facility and design because Singapore is actually hotting up faster than many parts of the world. And, you know, definitely greenery is the way forward. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can try to take a stab at Catherine's second question. So Catherine, I really appreciate how you, you're thinking about, you know, again, the individual and, and what, what, what can be done and, and this balance between um, environment, uh, economics, and, and you, know, the, you know, basically the components of sustainability and how, how to bring it all, all together. It's, it's not, not, not an easy question. I think it relates a bit also to Ginkat's question earlier about you know, who, all these different stakeholders, how can we actively play a role? I think it has to do with the challenge of um, uh, that the cost of a lot of the, you know, the waste and emissions that we have to deal with is, is externalized, right? So it's not something that we can uh, appreciate. And therefore, you know, when, when a consumer is faced with a more expensive and greener option, or a cheaper and less green option, you know, people tend towards, uh, you know, the, the, the second one. Um, so, so how do we overcome that? And uh, I think to to realize action, you know, uh, you know, like like what Esther mentioned at the very beginning, is about awareness first. You know, be no, knowing the right steps to take. That that's the, that's the first step, right? Awareness. And and it's, and then how do we then translate that to action? I think it takes a few things. Um, uh, other than awareness, is is also partly the leadership and 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 and, and put, put, um, in in our individual realms. You know, what what can be done. As individuals, I think we can take charge of a few decisions that we have, like you were saying, in a household level, choices of appliances or choices of now uh, electricity retailers. Also, we have a choice, right? The ones that invest more in solar versus those that do not. So, so we have a choice there where we can, we can decide that. But in our communities also, right? So if, if you belong to a school or you work with a company, you know, what, what other initiatives can we try to push forward to, to promote that within our individual small communities? And I, th I think that's how it starts to, to spread. But otherwise, it is very challenging to overcome this, uh, the whole current the economic structure where, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a bit of a tension. But there are some opportunities where I think 
um, saving energy, saving uh, resource, cons uh, reducing resource consumption is aligned, right, with, with uh, the economic goals. So you can, uh, if we can reduce our electricity bill, why not? If we can, uh, you know, save more, uh, like uh, not, not, buy, not have to spend more, why, why not? So uh, uh, it's about finding these opportunities as well. So thanks, thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Yeah, Catherine, if, if I may just really quickly too. So, so I think these are, it's, to me, it's not a kind of either or where we have, um, you know, uh, green, natural green areas have to then make space for, for urban areas. And, and, but then we can offset that a little bit by greening up the urban area. I mean, I, I think urban areas that are greener are more livable and more sustainable urban areas. But then at the same time, I think there is this real need to have large, uh, intact and robust ecosystems, forests, reefs, grasslands, because uh, because of this uh, in environmental provision is the services that 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 we derive from them in terms of water, the water vapor that creates weather systems, both local and global weather systems, um, the natural products that we we get from them, and so Singapore is a really interesting experiment because we can't expand the city where we're 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 limited by this small little island, um, but maybe that is a solution. I mean, you see you see other places where you have a city center and then this urb, suburban sprawl that just spreads and spreads and spreads, just consumes and consumes lots of land. That's clearly not a sustainable way to to do things, and and so I think. It, you know, it's hard to actually see this vast landscape and then to ring fence and say, this is where the city will go and the rest will leave kind of as, as countryside. But but really, I, I think this more integrated way of, so there's the land use, which is a big issue, plus how you use that land and how do you take, you know, take care of the resources. So again, maybe that's why it's not so easy because there's so many things that need to be integrated kind of locally, regionally, you know, across this whole landscape. Um, one, one other thing I thought was kind of interesting too is just real quick on water. We use 141 liters of water per day, something like that, latest estimates. And that's actually pretty good. It's come down quite a bit over just the last 10 years. And if you remember how, um, before we, we used to have to keep away from the water. We can't swim in the reservoir. We can't go down in the canal. Everything was barricaded. And over the past 15 years, the PUB has actually tried to integrate water into our lives. They have that Active Beautiful Waters uh, uh, program, uh, ABC Waters, Active Beautiful Clean Waters. And the idea is if water became uh, a bigger part of our lives where we could actually have an emotional attachment to water, we might actually take care of it. Uh, a little bit better. But then you look at some, I was just reading some other countries. It's unbelievable. Uh, Estonia, Lithuania, they use 85 liters of water per day. Uh, uh, Estonia, Estonia 100, Belgium 115. So there are countries that do much, much better than, than we do. So again, there, there is still room for improvement. But I think, you know, for some people, by seeing statistics, amount of CO2, megatons of waste generated, I think people can come up with the appropriate behavior to change. But I think for other people, they might need a more emotional link to, to some of these issues. And so that's where I see maybe perhaps nature and appreciation of nature can eventually become part of this sustainability, circular economy type things, because you actually see um, uh, a piece of land where those resources came from. And then you can kind of relate to what is a wise use and what's a respectful use of that land in a way that allows us to thrive as well as uh, not um, taking away from the future of the planet. So we have uh, seven more minutes before we end. And I thought I would just, uh, uh, I know Ginkiet, you have your hands raised, but if any of you wish to speak, you know, please raise your hands. Uh, and we'll give you a chance to ask your questions. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Ginkate to ask the questions. But meanwhile, I think we can take another two or three questions. If anyone has uh, questions to ask, please raise your hand. Off to you, Ginkate. Hi, thank you, Aslam. A couple of comments here. First of all, let's not forget, uh, last year, NEA says that we have reduced the total volume of waste going to you know, uh, disposal. But that's the good news. The, the rather bad news is that for the last five years, our recycling rate has been like hovering around 60, 61%. And in fact, for last year, it's gone down. So obviously, maybe next this year, you know, it will go down because of COVID. Bearing in mind, of course, that waste, 
about two thirds of our waste is generated by industry. All right. But again, industry has a recycling rate like 70, 80%. And obviously, like construction is something like 99% and steel, 99%. Uh, and NEA has data, you know, uh, municipal waste recycling is not like, it's like in the 20, 20% plus. So obviously, a lot more has to be done. So maybe it's a matter of perception. One is obviously they need that incentive or a disincentive. But let's face it. Do we need to rename recycling and call it uh, urban mining or something more exotic? Yeah, uh, sort of like, you know, recycling gets very boring, isn't it? Uh, of course, in the first place, if we reduce, then there's even less to recycle. That's one part. The other one that's not so obvious is in terms of the quantity of waste, food waste is actually the biggest sector. All right. So I see very little has been done, uh, although there are biodigesters, but, you know, their use is only converting from one form of waste to another form and more of a water reduction. So there's not much effort on there. Yeah, uh, we don't have anything that really converts that into energy or something. Although I know that the future uh, integrated facility in Tuas is coming out, but it's going to be a few more years. But nonetheless, even if we have such facilities, we need to change the mindset of people to reduce in the first place. So that's my comment. So how do we encourage people towards that? Thank you. So the question is, how do we motivate and nudge people to, you know, recycle, reuse? Uh, so about the individual. Um, yeah, not nudge or push that? maybe. <laughs> who would like to do that? Uh, Esther or Lynette or... Well, in the beginning that I would do, I already said that actually um, a circular economy is really require a, a human you know effort to 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 change the whole mindset and uh, well, uh, Jintia has a very good data already yes last year was 59 percent in terms of recycling and uh, from the corporate level maybe you, you know you're, you're, you're very right like demolition construction waste is 99 percent that is almost like hundred percent already and for ourselves our own, own construction waste we also set high Targets to you know to reduce and uh, at the moment we are at uh, 63 percent and we are also moving up the bar and uh, apart from you know uh, looking at recycling uh, we also look at construction waste that how do we turn it into uh, one examples that we have done is to uh, turn it into art pieces you know that you can actually give it a new lease of life and uh, we have one that is like installed at uh, our sustainability academy since 2017 and you you may have already seen it and we have we are two we have two more at uh, uh, we are commissioning, uh, going to be uh, uh, installed at uh, uh, Geylang, Saraya. Uh, so definitely there are many ways, but it all boils down to whether, you know, whether there is a deliberate effort. Once you have the, you know, mindset and uh, conviction to do it, you will find creative way to do so. And also we have always been, you know, uh, committed to scout for new idea, innovation, technology is where you can make the quantum leap. Like uh, if built for building sector, like adopting PPVC, prefabricated, pre uh, pre finished uh, volumetric uh, construction technology help us to raise productivities by 40%. Not, without technology, you can't really achieve that. So it's like, but in the end of the day, it's like the human convictions that you want to scout for solution and technology. And in the end of the day, it's like consumer, whether they also appreciate it, you know, and if there is supply and demand, I think we are in the, in the good track to, you know, to fast track change. Yeah. Right. Lenette, mm -hmm. I saw you were about to answer. So you want to chip in? Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Asura. I thought that's a great response. I mean, uh, Ginkit, I really enjoy your, your question also because it's not just about the technology, it's about the behavior and how do we nudge the right behaviors in, in, in the right direction. So I was very curious about this at one point and I looked up this very nice paper called um, The Dragons of Inaction, which talks about why, it was written by a psychologist, it talks about why it's so difficult to motivate um, uh, people you know to overcome all of the different psychological barriers to 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 doing something uh, different you know contrary so i recommend you you take take a look at that that paper um but there are many things there i mean it talks about you know like uh, um uh, so, so peer influence is, is one thing uh, or uh like um um uh, 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 uh what is it called um, 
being irrational you know trying trying to avoid being irrational is, is, is another aspect so it's, it's a really interesting one but but i feel it's a critical one because it's not just about the technology like as i mentioned you know it has we have we have the means to do it but it's about how do we nudge people so there, i think there are different initiatives i've seen uh, like game gamification so they've tried to make recycling a game and and and, and all that uh, but i also like to emphasize that again from from my, my earlier start starting deck of slides is that recycling is, is not the only one i mean so coming back to that question about which one is more uh, preferable uh, in, in a sense rice, recycling is, is sort of like the, the last resort right if we cannot reuse it if we cannot remanufacture it if we cannot refurbish it then we have to resort to recycling the material which is you know like i think was highlighted in some of the the questions that was raised in the in the chat it's a very knowledgeable audience here recycling takes resources as well you know, right we have to collect them we have to use the energy and, and all that so first is to i, I think reduce consumption if we can, uh, reuse and extend the lifetimes of products as, as long as possible. So thanks. I mean, I, I would like to think that, you know, oftentimes we look at these, some of these numbers on recycling or water usage or the amount, you know, and, and it just seems like progress is so, uh, so slow and difficult. Um, but, but at the same time, you might think maybe sometimes it's not just a case of where, where it's, a, it's a kind of a linear type progress. It might be really, really slow, but perhaps you hit a kind of critical mass where all of a sudden you go from one state to another. And so we could go from, you know, we could be today quite environmentally unfriendly, but, but who knows, once there's enough people out there who just have this conviction, we'll just kind of change and become unrecognizable overnight. I mean, you could think of this in, in terms of many um, things that I, I certainly use, the uh, technologies that I use would, would, would have seemed like kind of science fiction to me uh, as a boy, but, but the, 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 the way these things, not just the technical advancement, but the, the attitudes and people's willingness to try and do new things um, it can, can surprise. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's the case with some of these environmental issues too in the circular economy, certainly. Okay. Um, I hope the speakers can give us a few more minutes before, you know, extend the time by a bit. I see one more hand and I'll take that as the last questions before we just ask for concluding comments. So Taliang, you're going to pose your last question. Hi, hi, hi everybody. I'm Taliang from NUS. I work on sustainability matters. I just wanted to maybe add a comment or the suggestion to reply to, I think, Mr. Ong's question about nudging and behavior. So um, just to share an experience, um, a couple of months ago, I measured just one um, trade return point in the National University of Singapore, in one of the canteens, and I found that in a day, we wasted about 200 kg of food waste, things that you don't eat on your plate, right? So one very simple thing that we could do in terms of nudging, right, is that, for example, for storeholders, they could use smaller scoops instead of larger scoops, right? So instead of like one big scoop of rice, you know, um, that sort of thing. So change the default options, all right, and give consumers a choice, all right? So like now you order bubble tea, you can order 50%, 35% sugar, 30% sugar or whatnot. So you can go for larger, smaller, or medium, small portions of uh, food. Um, simple things that, that, that we can do, right? uh, don't have to involve changing laws, changing societies, things that we can do um, at a very micro level to help change behavior. And we can do much, many, many of this in all the different uh, uh, um, premises and context that, 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 that we operate in. Yeah, just a comment and suggestion on the point of nudging and behavior change. Yeah. Oh, very good. Thank you so much, Taliang, for sharing. So um, I'm just going to end the session with perhaps inviting our panelists to uh, answer the, the last questions that I have in my mind. And, uh, you know, let's keep it as tight and short as we can. Uh, so, you know, we have this new ministry, Minister, you know, Esther, you mentioned it. Uh, it's basically a rename of our newer into a MSE Ministry for Sustainability and the Environment. Uh, and clearly we have, uh, you know, as, as panelists, you have high hopes of this ministry. So what would be some of your, uh, I guess, uh, ask or request, you know, that this ministry look into urgently that are gaps that we see today in the current programs that we are running? So very quickly, just a few words. Who wants to go? Lynette, you look like you want to get, go for it. 
<laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I appreciate the, the the name change is acknowledging you know the importance of sustainability as a whole, not just in, in environment and, and water resources. So looking at economy and social uh, impacts as well. Um, I guess my 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 hope, you know, like 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 was mentioned earlier, I think there are different pockets of activities. A lot of the environmental initiatives are in different sectors and industries in particular, but um, a, a systems perspective can be helpful sometimes. So if if we maybe measure security for Singapore as a whole. You know, if we can rank that, measure that, manage that, I think I think that would that would that would be helpful. Of course, sector specific will still be helpful because that's where the the action happens. Uh, but having this overview uh, would 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 be, would be nice to have. Yeah. Okay, Esther. Well, my wish list is very, very long, but I just focus on a, a couple of them. I think for business, I mean, uh, everybody know that the economic environment is not going to be pretty, it's very, very challenging. So if there is, are there are ways that can help uh, business to make sustainability integration a, more, a stronger business case that will help. And the other thing, again, I'm talking about consumers. Consumer needs the stronger net to make them feel that and uh, also, uh, invest in green product is something that is not just good for the environment, but also good for the pockets because everyone is, is facing a very challenging economic environment now. So what sort of incentive can we give to the normal men in the streets to help them to move you know, uh, forward to adopt it? And one thing that I've been pushing for almost 10 years now is the green mortgage. You know, When you buy a green home, you, know, you will get a little bit you know, sweetener or some incentive in terms of green home mortgage that will help because that is big ticket item. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, you know, everyone needs to survive in order to, you know, to, to save ourselves and save the planet. Thank you so much. Yeah, for me, um, I, just three levels, both. So three things, the, the leadership, the agency itself, and then us as individuals as part of a society. I, I noticed that, um, you know, Minister Masagos, of when he was at Muir was somebody who really embraced, he didn't just, it was not from a technical point of view, but he really embraced the environment. He actually cared deeply about it emotionally. And I hope that uh, our new incoming minister, uh, Ms. Uh, Esther Fu, Grace Fu. Uh, Grace Fu, sorry, <laughs> Grace Fu, her sister I'm talking about, Grace Fu is similarly invested and energized and excited about the sustainability uh, imperative. So, I, so I'm looking for the same kind of uh, ins inspirational guidance from the minister uh, and continuing the tradition that uh, Minister Masagos uh, left. Secondly, as an agency, I think we are wonderful at technical uh, issues and engineering, and that's our strength. Uh, but I think what for me was often missing with the environment uh, and environment and water resources ministry was that some of the nature-based solutions really didn't become part of a, um, a part of the strategy and that because that's dealt with another with another ministry mnd which has end parks so i hope that this issue becomes a bit more integrated and lastly i hope you know of course the the, the ministry's job is to deal with things within singapore's borders but i hope in terms of uh trying to encouraging a certain kind of mindset they ask all of us in Singapore, not just to think locally, but really think in terms of the global, regional and global impacts of our activities. We do everything that we can within our borders, but we think and act like global citizens and, and to help beyond our shores. And I think that's where we'll really become part of this much needed uh, future uh, solution. Thank you so much, Dr. Lam. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Chia, Lynette, Prof Chia, and uh, Esther. Uh, and I think today we have a very broad ranging and you know, widely covered uh, areas of discussion. And I like the fact that we, we not only have a very active discussion uh, verbally, but if you really look at the group chat, I see many of you are replying to questions raised by other participants as well as our panelists, you know, taking the trouble to even comment and reply to the questions uh, in the group chat. So for that, uh, I, I find that this is very refreshing that, you know, we are all fully engaged in the entire conversation, not just, you know, verbally, but also, you know, replying to each other. And I think this is really how uh, we should have conversations like this, right? We don't have to agree, uh, but we don't have to disagree, but we have to be critical about the issues. And I like the way uh, 
some of you posed uh, challenging questions. I mean, uh, Maurice's question of, you know, can we believe in the science? And then uh, we are getting replies from other audiences in response to that. And uh, Dr. Lam, you coming in to share the perspective that, yes, it is a science, it's based on science, but it's also based on science of a model. And models are based on data. And, you know, these are all new ideas and new technologies that being, are being applied to the study of the environment and climate. So obviously in the years to come, as technology improves, as models improve and algorithms improve, I think the, the, the data may tell us something different. So we cannot discount that fact. But there's one thing that I think is very clear in the minds of, of many of us here, and I hope we take that away. We must do something about you know, changing the way we live. I, the message coming from the, from the panelists about uh, the demand side, right? We as individuals changing behaviors, I think it's very critical. So one, one big nudge that uh, happened to me in this COVID period was uh, air conditioned you know, bill. I realized that you know, my utility bills actually doubled. Then when we went in to check, I was like, my goodness, what is happening? And I realized the kids' aircon were on, everyone's aircon were on. So we did a, a dramatic change. We, uh, we bought fans and we said, okay, we're just going to time uh, the switch off, switching on of the aircon for a, maybe an hour. And then after that, we use the fan. And that just cools down the room so we go to bed. And uh, I haven't seen the bill yet, but I hope that, you know, that would dramatically reduce uh, the, the amount. But it does point to one thing, right? We need to have incentives. We need to have these incentives. And the interplay of these incentives and these incentives, I think, is really the key in uh, how we need to solve some of these problems. And I really like Esther's idea about the green mortgage. It's a new idea. I never heard of it. Uh, and I learned, walked away learning something ab about uh, that, that concept. Right? So with that, um, let's give a nice big virtual thank you and big clap to our three uh, panelists. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us on this topic. We really appreciate it. And of course, to all the audience for signing up, attending, and staying throughout the event. So on behalf of the Sustainable SG Collective, our thanks and we'll see you again.